Okay, well, hi everyone. Welcome to Save the Date, your dating survival guide from Coffee Meets Bagel. Each episode, I bring in a dating expert to explore what it takes to go on great dates and ultimately find a great relationship. So in the last episode, we touched on beginning with an end in mind. If you want to meet a great partner and find a great relationship, it's a lot easier to navigate there if you have a clear picture of what that should look like for you. What I'm particularly excited for all the daters out there is that once you have this clear picture, you are in a position to be able to create from a blank slate. You're not stuck with anyone right now. You're not dealing with any existing relationship. You can just go out there and create whatever kind of relationship that you want to create, which personally, from my experience, I think it's a lot easier, not easy, but easier than trying to fix a broken relationship, which I can tell you from my own experience, it's excruciatingly difficult to change and sometimes just impossible. So that's why I'm really excited to have today's guest help you understand what research has uncovered about what great relationships should look and feel like so you can go and start creating that. Eli Finkel is the author of the New York Times bestselling book, The All or Nothing Marriage, How the Best Marriages Work, where he researched all aspects of marriage and uncovered what what it takes for modern long-term relationship to work and how you can get there. He's also the director of Relationship and Motivation Lab at Northwestern University, where he published over 150 scientific papers on love and relationship. And he's also a contributor to the op-ed page of the New York Times. The Economist has identified him as one of the leading lights in the realm of relations, relationship psychology. Wow, what a long list of accomplishments, Eli. <laughs> Welcome. Well, thank you for listing them. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm really honored to have you here and super excited for our conversation. How are you today? Good, good. Yeah, it's a lovely day here in Chicago. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so before we get into the juicy details of today's content, I want to clarify one thing for our audience. So 91% of Coffee Meets Bagel daters are looking for long-term relationship, but not everyone is looking for marriage right now. So your t- book title is All or Nothing Marriage. However, I think we can assume that a lot of principles that we're going to talk about today just apply to you know long general long-term committed relationship. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. I I mean, I I do think there are some interesting properties about the way that society redefines what marriage is. But yes, the general principles we're talking about apply to long-term relationships in general. Great, great, great. So what I find really interesting is that in the book, you mentioned that the genesis of this research is the fact that in the beginning, you didn't believe that long-term committed relationships such as marriage actually is fitting for the modern world and that marriage might be in trouble. Could you tell us why you believe that? Well, I thought there was a disconnect between what we were asking of our marriages these days and what this one relationship can realistically provide. Um, That was my working thesis. The the working title of the book was very different from the final title of the book. Um, And it wasn't crazy. I mean, some of the ideas that were in in the initial thesis actually made the final book. But the, the idea is we're throwing more and more and more in terms of expectations on this one relationship. That's not the way social life worked. 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. And at the same time, it's not like we're investing that much more, even as we expect all of our emotional needs to be met or or many of them to be met through this one relationship. It's not like, well, we're all taking classes on how to communicate more effectively and spending several hours a day engaged in that sort of communication. So I, I thought marriage was basically getting stuck in this vice between the expectations we were bringing and the amount that we were investing in it. Yeah, and, and, and it's so true. We do put a lot of pressure into this one relationship. And I think we've kind of gotten in the, as a society, uh, in the uh, practice of uh, just looking at this one person for a lot of different things, which of course, um, it's kind of setting this relationship up for failure. So you begin with that kind of thesis in, 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 in the beginning. And then throughout the research, your view changes. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, it, it actually, it changed in a fun way. So, um, so I'm basically, a, you know, a, a psychology researcher. So I will bring couples into our, our, I use the word lab, but I don't want anyone to think in terms of beakers. It's like a sofa with like a coffee table. And then we observe people interacting. And then we might, 
you know, survey them over the next couple of years. Like, like I'm pretty knowledgeable about research that does that. But there are other fields that use different methods, economics and history and sociology and on down the list. And so I, I took this interdisciplinary tour. Like, what is it that the world knows? What is like, the, you know, the collective body of knowledge about this? And the story that emerges from that is, is not really one of decline, not, not one of like, hey, all we're killing this relationship, but rather one of divergence. That is, we've placed within reach a level of marital fulfillment that was out of reach in earlier eras, which is awesome. So some of us will be able to connect in ways that really would have been pretty difficult in 1950 or 1800. But at the same time, we have indeed made this relationship more fragile, more precarious, harder to reach like basic level of happiness, but possible to reach pretty exquisite level of happiness. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing is that it's possible, like, and, and when you actually re reach that, when you actually are able to create that fulfilling, happy relationship, it has such a profound impact on you and probably your partner in a level that we've never actually experienced before historically. But it's very difficult to obtain that. That's right. Is what I'm hearing. So, so let's get into the meat of it. So that sounds really exciting because, wow, like if I can obtain that, that's going to be transformative. But so, so what are those elements um, that actually make up such certain relationships so exquisite? Uh, yeah. Because my main goal for today is for our data for, and the listeners out there to be able to have a clear picture of that so that they can go and start building toward that. Yeah, although let me say from the outset that, that shooting for exquisite is great because it puts exquisite within reach, but it also is, you know, can be disappointing, right? This is the idea of the all or nothing marriage is that as our expectations have changed in the ways that I'll describe in just a minute, we've simultaneously done something good, which is increased the high end of what we can achieve in a marriage while also making it more fragile. The, the basic idea is, and, and I find it useful to remind everybody about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this triangle here, right? So in 1800, Marriage was about basic needs toward the, t the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy, literally things like physiological and safety needs, food, clothing, shelter. Like people didn't like kiss somebody goodbye and go to the office. You created your food, you created your shelter and you were not soulmates, you were workmates. And, and it mattered because life was fragile. People died young, they died in childbirth. It was like a different world. And so the idea that you'd be like, Dave is a good guy, but like my fingertips don't tingle when we kiss, like they would have just mocked you forever. And, and so that was what marriage was for a long time. First world problem. <laughs> First world, I mean, it's exactly right. It's exactly right. Like, why aren't they, t hey, start tingling, right? So, so then that's the way it was like from, I'm, I'm mainly focused on the US and the book, but from colonial times up until around 1850. And, and again, here I'm talking about sort of middle class marriage, which, which by and large was white middle class marriage. Mm. Um, and then around 1850, there's industrialization. Industrialization has a number of consequences, one of which is you get these factories that serve as magnets that draw people from rural communities, from other countries into urban centers. And for the first time ever anywhere, young people are geographically and economically independent of their parents. And they have freedom to make decisions about what they wanna do and they decide they wanna marry for love. And so starting around 1850 up until the mid 1960s, you're in the second of these two waves of marriage, these two models of how we can approach this thing. And it's really about a breadwinner homemaker vision where he has his sphere and she has her sphere and they connect across the, that sphere by like cherishing each other. In the 1960s, people find that they're not that happy with that. You know, not everybody, but on balance, people think, boy, these social roles are constricting. I don't really want to have only my half of the world and you get your half of the world. We both want to be both assertive and nurturing. We don't want to have to choose. And so then you end up with what, where we are now from the 60s till about now, which, which I call the self-expressive era, where not only are we still looking for love in the marriage, in our relationship, but we're also looking for something, something deeper and more psychologically complicated like self-expression or personal growth, authenticity. And, and so it wouldn't shock many of the people on this call if, if you heard a friend say, look, I love Dave. He's a good man and a good father, but I don't feel like I'm growing in this marriage. I feel stagnant in this marriage and I'm not gonna live the last, the, the last 40 years of my life like that. So, so as these expectations have ascended Maslow's hierarchy, we're up here looking for self-actualization. 
it turns out that fulfilling self-actualization in your marriage is pretty powerful, more powerful than for people who weren't even trying to do that. But at the same time, fragile, delicate, precarious, lots of discussion, lots of communication, lots of mutual insight. For those of us who can do it, though, it's pretty sweet. Right. Let's, let's revisit my, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs because I think that really is kind of the crux of the, uh, uh, your thesis and the, what, what you found. And for, you know, I want to make sure for, for, for those of us who are not really familiar with that, could you just kind of revisit and explain yeah. each level? Yeah. So, I mean, he talks about five levels and, and, you know, people mess around with various versions, but at the bottom you get these like physiological and safety needs. So literally things like staying warm when it's cold. Like marriage was essential for that in 1800. It is not essential for that for most of us today. The middle levels are, are things like belonging and love, feeling connected, not necessarily with one person, but we've tied it to the, the marriage as a, a primary place that we do that. And then as you go up to the top, you get these esteem needs, feeling good about ourselves, feeling respected, and self-actualization way, way up there at the tippy top of Maslow's hierarchy. And by self-actualization, it, it's, it's sort of what I meant when I talked about authenticity, the, the concept being that we want to be who we really are. And we, we're, um, whether we've articulated this to ourselves or not, most of us today, or at least large swaths of us today, are, are looking for a marriage that not only makes us feel loved and connected and where we get to love and connect to the other person, but also a, a sense that we're bringing out the, the best in each other, that, that each of us is, is living an authentic life, pure and um, uh, well aligned with who we really are deep down. And that's become part of the expectation. And it is a big ask, yeah. but it's also a pretty cool one. Right. And this... Um... I, this Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I think it's it's so um, uh, important. Like last week, we actually, uh, we had a dating coach uh, and who talked about, you know, not specifically what kind of relationship we should create, but what kind of partner. And uh, one of the discussions we also had there is, you know, distinguishing between the needs, like what do you need, uh, what are your needs versus what are your wants? Because what are your wants is kind of optional. It's like your preference, but not necessarily, you don't really need to need it. But when it comes to your needs, you absolutely need to meet it. And I think Maslow's hierarchy of needs just does a really beautiful job organizing yeah. uh, fundamental human needs across, you know, different cultures and um, what, what they are really so that you can easily understand and kind of ask yourself, like, am I, am I getting these needs met from my relationship? And ultimately what you find, found is that in a relationship that really works and it, people are having like this profound um, uh, impact on each other is relationship where the higher needs, the not only the love and belonging, and I feel really secure, um, you, you know, that need is is being met, but also my esteem needs, you know, I'm feeling really respected. Um, and then also my self-expression needs, which is like, I'm kind of being the best version of myself. And I feel like I'm really growing through this relationship. Yeah. May, may I, I just want to riff a little bit on what, on what you said, the, the life coach um, said last week, because that seems like a very good insight to be aware, like, what really matters to me? What's essential? What would be nice to have, you know, if it, if it went well? F for me, there's another distinction that I think is valuable, which is which of these things, whether they're needs or wants, need to be fulfilled through this one person. Mm -hmm. And this is where I think we've, again, I don't want to say we've gone astray, because these are always trade-offs. But but nobody, you know, handed Moses on Mount Sinai a couple tablets that said, these are all the needs that you must get from your wife, from your husband, um, from your significant other. And, and so in the book, I, I talk about like, you could actually get conscious, get deliberate, like, what are the needs that I'm asking of this relationship? And then you could be specific and say, you know, to what extent is it really crucial that I meet this need through this person? right? Like maybe you like to talk philosophy or play tennis or have good sex. I have some controversial stuff in there. Does that always have to happen with your primary partner? Like there's a bunch of ways that we can ask more of the relationship when we play to our strengths, but also ask less of our relationship in ways that, that, are, that are sensible in light of who you are and who I am and who we are as a couple. And so, uh, you know, you have a concept I talk about in the book is an other significant other or an OSO. Right? There's other people, there's friends, there's siblings. Could these people be the people you turn to when you're feeling stressed out at work? And every time you say that to your partner, he's like, ugh, this topic again? Maybe there's like a better person for that one. And it's not a profound incompatibility with this particular partner so much as like 
a misdirection of where you're looking for support from what is what is and should be a broader social network. I love that point uh, because kind of just going back to the initial uh, discussion we had about putting so much pressure into this one relationship. And um, I think because of the social expectation of what uh, uh, significant other relationships should be, we, uh, we have a tendency to grow up, at least in the U.S., and I'm sure a lot, a lot of other parts of the world, where you do actually have to do everything together and you do have to share everything uh, with your significant other, which lot. I, right. It, it is a lot. And based on my personal experience, absolutely not necessary. Like um, I, my long-term partner right now, uh, we do, we're so different and we have many, many different interests. And I am one of those people who like to kind of go out there and try new things. He's a very much of homebody. And a lot of times um, I travel by myself to try yeah. different things with my friends and a lot of my own friends are surprised by that. Oh, wow, you're not, mm -hmm. you're not actually like, I go to weddings by myself. Um, you're, you're not actually going together. And I, I think it can be a point of contention for mm -hmm. a lot of people when things are just not like, we have to be kind of doing everything together, which um, yeah, to your point, I, I think it kind of let, adds unnecessary pressure. For, for, look, it, it depends, right? Like I happen to be kind of like you. I, I think some amount of independence and some amount of, you know, travel by myself. I think those things are fun. Some people wouldn't want it. And it, some people feel like deeply connected or they'd be jealous if, you know, if their partner were off traveling. So, you know, again, this is um, in terms of the book, but in general, it's, there are no one size fits all solutions. It's not like I can tell you, these are the 10 things that you need to do in order to have a great marriage because, it's like, these are the, it's not 10, but these are the 10 ways to think about issues that are relevant in your life and in your partner's life and in your, in your marriage or relationship. And, and which of these things are kind of biggies that we deal with here? Like, I don't want to be involved as my, you know, romantic partner or marriage partner with somebody who doesn't list those things. But, but remember that each additional one you list should probably come with a thing that you're not listing. Right? right. Like each, it's not like we can just be like, well, throw that one in there and that one in there. It's like this horror. You'll end up with this awful stew. And so and so being conscious of this, of each additional ask that we're making, I think is a good I idea because it also sensitizes us to what are we asking? What does that mean? Like what sacrifices are we going to make? What are we not going to ask of these things? And if I'm really going to ask all of these things of this partner and God bless, like if you have thought this through and think this is the way you want to do it, I certainly am not going to tell you not to do that. That's terrific. What is it going to take in terms of effort from me, effort from my partner, um, effort from the two of us, maybe like friends, social life? What is it going to take to make sure that the relationship can actually deliver on all those expectations that we're bringing to it? Right. Yeah, you're right. It really depends on the person. Um, you know, some for some people, it is very important that, you know, we do... Right certain things together and that's what kind of makes them happy i think just to your point we have to be conscious of the fact that like what are we actually requiring and are we setting on you know what kind of bar are we setting for this relationship to be able to succeed and the fact that it doesn't have to be that way right. uh that awareness i think is important great so this self-expressive growth model, I, I think it's a very novel concept. And uh, especially because when people typically think about like, okay, what is a great relationship and what, what should be the component there? I think some of the factors that are commonly thought about are things like commitment, trust, respect, you know, maybe appreciation. And, um, you know, I think in fact, recently you co-authored this paper that looked at what are the predictors of relationship quality. And I think um, one of the biggest uh, a predictor of relationship satisfaction was uh, your own perception of your partner's commitment to the relationship. So mm -hmm. commitment seems to be really important. So how does this self-expression personal growth uh, element uh, play together with the things like trust, respect, um, you know, commitment, things like that. Ooh, that's a lot. That's a lot happening together. L let me say one thing about about the trust issue and the perception of your partner's commitment, because I, I think this is one of the so there is this this discipline. Most people don't know this. There is this academic discipline called relationship psychology or relationship science, where we use empirical methods, the methods of science to try to collect data to see like on average, does this predict relationship well-being? Does this predict divorce? And so one of the interesting ideas that's come out of this field, the, the field that, that I'm a part of, is, is that you have, to, you have to choose, right? You, you can 
either feel like safe and protected from exploitation and hurt, or you can have high levels of intimacy in your relationship. You kind of can't maximize on both. And the reason why that is, is that essential to true intimacy is that I've handed you my love and heart and vulnerability. Like that is part of what it is to connect with somebody at the deepest way that we are going to, that we are going to hold each other's hearts and be gentle and tender with them. But that's not a way to make sure that your partner doesn't hurt your feelings or to, to make sure that he or she doesn't exploit you. So, so this is one of the really interesting issues. I talk about it in the book from the context of like this porcupine's dilemma, like you might wanna get close to your partner, but like, ouch, right? Like you just stuck me. And so how do we, how do we navigate this idea that we, we want to feel like we're not gonna be hurt, we want to feel close. And, and so one of the major issues we deal with, and this is about trust, this is about perceived partner commitment is, are we willing to make ourselves vulnerable to our partner? Because frankly, if we're not, then there's really no way to have the deepest type of connection. Right. But if we are willing to do that, we must understand that that makes us vulnerable. And, and that's one of the tensions that we get. So I wouldn't say that's exactly about the, the self actualization or self expressive element of marriage, but alongside these aspirations for self expression, we've got this balancing act between are we really gonna go all in despite the potential pain or are we gonna protect ourselves despite the fact that that means we can't have the best. And I don't know what the norms are for these. This is my first ever Instagram live, but your email sign off, what do you have? It's like courage over- Courage comfort. over comfort, yes. I think you're talking about that, right? And, and when like in your, your signature line, it says courage over comfort. I think you're saying, you wouldn't give this advice to every single person, but I think you're saying go off the high dive and take a jump. And I think you'd be the first to acknowledge, I, I suspect that there are bad things that can happen if you go on the high dive and jump. And I think what you're saying is try it anyway, right? Right, yeah, and it's definitely not gonna be comfortable. That's right. Um, but uh, to your point, if you do want to have that deepest connection um, that, that has a profound uh, impact on, on both of you, um, it is kind of a requirement almost um, to be able to get there. Uh, this is a good segue into my next question, which was going to be, okay, so we, this, this sounds all really great, um, but you also lay out a lot of challenges that is um, involved with this, one of them being the porcupine dilemma. And I actually really love the quote that you uh, cited in the book by the um, philosopher Howard Thurman. Uh, on the porcupine theory, uh, the, the dilemma, I want to feel completely vulnerable, completely naked, completely exposed and absolutely secure. And that That's kind of the two things we want. We want both, but it's just not possible, like you said, to, it to have it, which which is why uh, creating this really great relationship is so challenging. What are some oh, wait, other- Wait, wait, could I interject? Because it is yes. possible in a sense, I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay. It is possible through trust, right? So right. you actually can't objectively be safe because if you if you're objectively vulnerable that means somebody objectively can hurt you so the solution that we've built to this the psychological solution is when you trust you get the most best of both worlds but but you better have guessed right right because you right. jumped off that high dive anyway i'm sorry to interrupt i yeah. just want to say it's possible to feel both even though objectively you can't have both. Right, no, that, I think that's a really great distinction. Um, so let's talk about the challenges because as daters, I think it's often very easy to feel like, okay, dating really is so freaking hard. And like, am I the only one who's feeling this way? And I, I just really want the daters, uh, everyone out there to know that it's not, it's not you. Dating and relationship is just really hard. And I love the fact that in the book, you even talk about personally, um, you know, some of the struggles and challenges you and uh, you, Allison, your, your mm -hmm. wife, wife yeah. um, have had um, in, in obtaining, trying to obtain and climb this um, Maslow's mountain. And mm -hmm. so could you talk about why some other reasons beside this porcupine dilemma, why this obtaining this great relationship can be challenging? Yeah, I, I mean, one of the things that is, um, that is interesting to me in the book in general, and anybody listening already can tell, like I'm very, I'm very persuaded that the world is involved, that, that the world is about trade-offs. Like you can get more of this, but it doesn't come free. And you can get more intimacy, but that means you're more vulnerable. You can get more safety, but that means you're not really going as, as deep as you can. I think that issue is, is more pervasive than we've talked about it. So, so for example, now let's ignore 
is my partner going to hurt me or not? Let's let's think of two other things that we really want to meet in in our relationship. One is this this deep sense of closeness and comfort. Th this sense like I could tell my partner anything and she'll still love me, um, or like could be in the bathroom with me and not mind. Like I don't have to be embarrassed about anything. And the other is I would love our relationship to be like hot and passionate. But, but again, when I say I would love, I think most of us don't think of that as a want. I think most of us, if we're making a lifelong commitment, think of that as a need, again, in the, in the lexicon of what your guest said last week. And so the question is, how compatible are those two things? Like, how is it that I can simultaneously cry to you about how much shame I have about my body and entice you to have like mad, passionate, like, you know, completely passionate sex with me or love with me and so forth. And I don't just mean about my body. That was one example that, that popped to mind, but it could be, I'm just, I have low self-esteem. I'm just ashamed of this. I mean, what does it mean really to be vulnerable? And is it hot? And so it's an interesting issue. Like, I, it's not like I'm saying this is not a solvable problem. And certainly many people are able to have high levels of intimacy and a very passionate life, but we shouldn't pretend that it's not complicated. And we shouldn't pretend that the reason why we expect our spouse or our significant other to be the only, to be the primary person responsible for both, that didn't, again, come from Mount Sinai. We did that. We as a culture built it such that the, the person that, that is supposed to be responsible for this mad passion, even this like expectation of mad passion is culturally relative. We want that today, but that wasn't the way people talked in 1800. And simultaneously, the person I'm going to look for look to for my primary vulnerability is also going to be this person. Is that a good idea? Well, I don't know if I were building it from scratch, like this Frankenstein that we've built about what marriage is, what I have built it. Maybe not. But people should at least be aware that one of the challenges of expecting these this particular set of things that most of us are looking for from the relationship is that not that they're incompatible, the set of expectations, but that maybe maximizing one, like I'm totally vulnerable to you, will not maximize the other. And in fact, makes it hard to maximize some of the others. So that again, I, I'm happy to talk about others, but that is another significant challenge associated with the way we have structured relationships today. Yeah, and you know, like like you said, it's not impossible, but it, it does seem so such a like, almost like an oxymoron, a lot of these elements that you mentioned that um, no wonder it's actually very difficult to achieve it's that. Hard. Yeah. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that we agree. This is hard, guys, <laughs> everyone. This is hard, but worth it because um, of, of all the reasons that we cited um, in the beginning of the show. Now, so we have these challenges, but I still want to go for it, right? I'm a dater. I'm looking for a long-term relationship, and I want a long-term relationship that really, like, kind of what you talked about has a profound impact on me and where I'm connecting at a deeper level where I'm, you know, growing, helping each other grow. So what can dayers start doing today, um, maybe differently, so that we can prep and maybe even anticipate these challenges and prep um, so we can, you know, have, maximize our chance of being able to create this amazing relationship? Well, I have more insights about what doesn't work than I do necessarily <laughs> about what does. I mean, we now have 15 years of data, I, I no longer view this as an open question about whether our intuitions about what we like in a partner, or sometimes in the, in the scholarly literature called mate preferences or ideal partner preferences, they, they are meaningless in, in terms of how much you actually like somebody. So it's true, Dawoon, that if you say you like hot people over ugly people, that you in fact like hot people over ugly people, that is not an interesting fact. The, the idea is if you like hot people more than your best friend says she likes hot people, is it true that when you meet people who vary in how hot they are, the hotness variation is more important to her than it is to you? Or not, not, not just looks, um, it could be earning prospects, it could be personality. Basically, we all like people who have these nice qualities, but this idea that we have a type, this idea that like, I like a guy who's at least blah tall and, and has this type of personality appears to be completely false. And it is like a story we tell ourselves. And to the degree that we tell ourselves those stories and therefore are unwilling to go on dates with certain people that don't seem to meet the, the I need somebody who travels. I will tell you that, that if you look at what people want and they believe that they know, 
and then you introduce them to people, because we've done these studies, the extent to which the partner has those qualities or doesn't have those qualities, those qualities that you think are especially important to you, is completely unpredictive of how attracted you are to the person. It looks like the majority, and this is, so I would say there are, there are two things I want to say that are more sort of positive. The, the first is, I'm sort of happy that if we're going to build the type of relationship structure that we have, like looking toward the top of Maslow's hierarchy, that we marry later. Because when we're 20, which is literally the age at which women in America, the, the average, the median woman married in, in America in 1960, the average man was 22. How well do you even know who you are? Like, I, I think there's a lot to be said for taking some time for some serious self-discovery to get a sense of like who you are and what it might look like to bring that person to your relationship. The rest in, of it, in, in yeah. fact, in the book, you, sorry to interrupt, but in the book, you quote statistics about uh, the age of your first marriage and the divorce rate, right? Yeah. Oh, yes. That, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to unconfound those from other variables, but yes, people who marry later, people who have their first marriage later are less likely to divorce than people who have their first marriage earlier. Those things are confounded with things, things like socioeconomic status, so it, it's hard to draw a clear causal conclusion, but, but my guess is that there is indeed a causal effect, such that if you marry when you're 30, you probably make a better decision or are readier to make the relevant sacrifices than, you, than if you're 20 or 25. I, I really want to highlight this because this is such a welcoming news. news. Um, a, lot of, a lot of us feel pressured. I think mm -hmm. um, today's daters feel pressured to be uh, attached married, um, at least being in a long-term relationship by a certain age. And um, I, I think the research is pretty clear. Like you said, yeah. it's better. I mean, again, if you're aiming for this uh, self-expressive personal growth uh, type of uh, partnership, it's better t for you to actually take more time to discover yourself, get more experience so that you know what you, um, who you are. And mm -hmm. that kind of can set you up for that, uh, uh, that kind of marriage uh, better, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm and I'm sensitive, and I and I know that you are as well. Like it, 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 you can easily get into a scarcity mindset. That's like, well, I'm, you know, I don't know, 37, and and as each each year that passes, there's like more people off the market, and who's left? And scarcity mindsets are are, um, you know, they're real. I, I'm not judging anybody who adopts a scarcity mindset. There are things that are scarce and they're stressful. But when we make decisions under under scarce mindset, we we are at risk for being impulsive. Um, and, you know, for example, if you think this house, this is the only house I could ever be happy. Well, that's a scarce mindset. And you will end up overpaying for that house, maybe evaluating it differently than you would if you were able to say, look, there are other houses I could potentially buy as well. And that, that applies in the, the dating market as well. Such a great point. I also love some of the points that you make about cultivating the art of loving in the mm -hmm. book. Could you talk a little mm -hmm. bit more about that? So Eric Fromm, um, who, who wrote a book in the 1950s, this is a, a, a 19, like mid 20th centuries, sort of like psychiatrist philosopher. Um, and he wrote a book called The Art of Loving, where he really criticizes what he views as, as a romantic ideal. Now, this is the 1950s. If anything, it's gotten more extreme. But the idea is when the right person comes along, it's going to be great. And Eric Fromm thinks that's ridiculous. Um, you wouldn't say when the right violin comes along, I'm going to be like a concert level uh, violinist, right? That, that the idea is that love is an art, it's a skill, it requires work. And I think there are two ways of thinking about that. One is, can we cultivate relationship skills in ourselves, even as a single person or when we're together, right? So there might be skills that are generally beneficial, like patience, like a willingness to try to adopt a third party perspective, even when we're feeling like our perspective is totally right. Um, those sorts of skills will generally be useful. But also once you're in a relationship, um, that, that it's not like you're going to be in a relationship and the, per the right person is going to come along and there won't be conflict and the sex will always be hot. I, if that's ever happened, I'd be surprised. <laughs> so this is a process of, of, yes, compatibility is a real thing, but a hell of a lot of how to build a good relationship is working on ourselves, working on the relationship, making it something that, that can actually work up there at the summit of, of, the, of the hierarchy. Yeah, and what I love about that point is that I think when it comes to dating, because it involves another person, and of course you're not, you cannot control um, everything about this other person. I think 
it's easy to feel a little bit helpless about yeah. this prospect of creating this great relationship. It's not definitely up to me. And yes, there are elements, there are definitely a lot of elements you cannot control and there's going to be luck involved and all that stuff as well. But when it comes to this art of uh, cultivating art of loving and this uh, skill, which I, I think it's a skill that you do cultivate, that's 100% within your control. If you want to be better at it, you can take the time, invest the time to be a better communicator, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I really love this point. And it's something that if you know, all of you listeners out there, if you want to uh, work on it, you can just start today. You, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. The, the only sort of caveat, and maybe this is exactly exactly what you were saying. So these things are hard to change. So in the sense that they're 100% in our control, it's 100% in our control to start working on it and make some progress. Most of us will go to our grave without having really perfected any of these things. But, but I agree with the 100% statement if what you mean is if our options are sit by and think, well, bummer, I just don't have these skills versus you know, get off our butts and make an effort, that is 100% in our control, I agree. It's, yeah, and especially when it comes to dating, you know, I think um, skills like, okay, how do I actually show up as myself, even though I'm feeling super nervous? I mean, okay. if you practice that, you can get better at that very, yes. very quickly. Um, there are three specific things that you mentioned in the book when it comes to this cultivating art of loving, communication, responsiveness, and play. And I thought that those are very specific and interesting choice. Could you tell us a little bit more about those three and why those threes are picked up in, uh, in the book? Um, sure. I'll, I'll mention um, the three briefly and maybe give an example of, of yeah. what I mean by play. So um, responsiveness, so, so again, all of this is based on, on uh, you know, one of the one of the things I really wanted to do in the book is, like I said, there is this field that nobody knows about called relationship science or relationship psychology. And for 75 years, thousands of people have devoted their careers to using scientific methods, that is testing hypotheses with data to try to figure out on average which things work and which don't. But most of that work is cloistered in academic journals. And so I wanted in the book to not only sort of build a framework to make sense of how to build a good relationship, but then also use it to try to review what we know about this stuff. And so responsiveness looks like it's one of these absolutely key variables in being a good partner and in having a good relationship. Again, it's not easy to become responsive. The, the idea of, so, so what makes us feel like our partner is responsive? When we feel understood, validated, and cared for. That is, our, we feel like what we are and what we're saying, our partner really understands that. The validation means like, they see somebody of worth when they look at us, or at least we think they do, and then they care. They care about what happens to us. So how do we go about doing these sorts of responsive things? This is exactly why cookie cutter solutions don't work. I, as you know, from reading the book, have some avoidant tendencies. So if I actually had something shaming at work or I like stubbed my toe, the worst thing my spouse could do, my wife could do, is be like, oh honey, and like stroke me. It's like, go away for five minutes and I will be ready to like deal with another person. And, and, and again, it, it's the problem with how do you deal with it when somebody's upset? Oh, you, you give them affection and love. And that is a good one on average. I'm not saying that that doesn't work on average, but it's tricky. So this is responsiveness. It's really attending to who this person is in this moment and our relationship with that person. Communication, I won't go into detail on this because I present like a two by two table in, in the book that, that talks about like active versus passive responding. And so, so I, I talk about the, the book is, it, it reviews evidence that suggests that, that it's not just about being nice, right? Communication in a relationship is not just about being nice. We also have to stand up for ourselves and what, what's important to us. So we talk a little bit about how to do that. In terms of play, this is one we kind of forget. I mean, in a sense, dating is play. It's like we go to plays. Well, I didn't even mean that, but we go to a movie, or at least there used to be a thing called movies and we used to go to them. Mm -hmm. And and yet, like in long-term marriage, it gets pretty routine, not just marriage, in long-term relationships, it can get pretty routine. And it turns out that even in the context of a long-term relationship, if you add some play, like deliberately add some play on balance, that is good, not only in terms of making us feel a little closer to our partner, but also in terms of making us feel hotter 
for our partner. And one of the studies that I review in, in the book that I find incredibly interesting is you can imagine that, that you're a participant in the study. There's three conditions. There's a control condition, a comfortable activities condition, and then, you know, to wound your jump off the high dive condition. And so we ask you over the next 72 hours, please do as many comfortable things as you can, or in the other condition, please do as many sort of fun and exciting things. And it turns out that both of those conditions, the, the comfortable activities and the exciting activities, make us feel closer to our partner. But it's only the exciting activities that also make us feel hotter for our partner. Mm. And so relationship psychology is getting to the point where we can say not just date nights are good, which on average they are, but what sorts of date nights are good for what sorts of things you'd like to build in a relationship. That's fascinating. Uh, and, um, you know, like when, when, when I, when, Typically, when I hear the word play, I'm thinking like, oh, spontaneous, it, it kind of has to come naturally. But I mean, kind of like what your experiment says, you could actually design even intentionally yeah. the sense of play in uh, dating and relationship. And, you know, especially in long term relationship, yeah. um, whatever was spontaneous and, you know, playful naturally kind of happened already. And unless you actually put in the time to intentionally create that, it's not going to come maybe sometimes, uh, but it's not gonna come. So you have to actually uh, put in the time to create that. Great. I think, uh -huh. I, I think just briefly, I, I think that looking for like spontaneous passion and spontaneous play, these things are great. And you, 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 know, you may get those and you might be one of the special people who 10, 15 years, 30, 50 years into a relationship still have this spontaneous fire that overtakes you for your partner. I, if somebody told me, that really play is supposed to be about spontaneity or passion is like supposed to be spontaneous. I, I would worry for that person's relationship, I, not because they're wrong, but because they're limited and because they have a vision for how this is supposed to work that is not representative of how most relationships ultimately develop. And if you're ruling out the possibility that we can schedule in some naughty time or schedule in some other type of play time, you are eliminating one of the great strategies for staying close in a relationship. Awesome, such a great point. Okay, so now, wow, this time super like really flew by really quickly. Um, I'm going to open up, um, uh, unless uh, Eli, you had some other points that you wanted to make. No, I'm gonna take no. some questions. Okay, great. Perfect. So uh, everyone, um, I picked out some questions that were submitted already. But please take the time to submit your questions now. Um, if you are a question, if your question is chosen, then we're going to send you a free copy of Eli's book, All or Nothing Marriage. Um, so uh, this is your time. So the first question, this was really appropriate for the topic that we discussed today. Uh, so now I know what it uh, what great relationship should look like. I want to aspire for that. That's my relationship goal. Um, of course, I have to talk about that with this potential partner. What is the best time to talk about relationship goals? Oh boy, um, here too, I, I suspect there's going to be high variation. And even if I told you, make sure to wait 12 months, you'd fall in love with somebody and like 45 minutes later, you know, be talking about whether, you know, he also wants to have a baby. Um, so I, I think it is reasonable to bring it up around the time that you think it would be reasonable to have conversations like, are, are we committed yet? And I, you know, that's a separate question when that should happen. And there's obviously, you know, for every single person listening in today, there's a different moment where that's going to feel right and it's gonna vary from one relationship to the next. But, but even, even the question, which I think is terrific, in a sense misses the issue because it's not a one-time conversation. You're going to change. Your partner's going to change. Your circumstances are going to change. Somebody's going to get fired from a job. COVID's going to hit. A baby's going to come. And everything that you thought was the deal is going to shift. And so it's not like the big conversation that happens once. And I think to the degree that these things sort of like just filter in over time, the better. You know, again, not if that means you don't get to the big stuff. But if you can sort of just have these then like an ongoing and open line of communication about those things, hopefully for the next 60 years, that's ideal. Right. And, and, you know, I know that sometimes people are looking for like this formula that I can follow because that feels easy. And yeah. uh, the, the, okay, it really depends on you and when you think is right. Is right. I absolutely agree with that stance. And, you know, it is, it is hard to 
kind of uh, tap into that and judge, okay, this, this feels like the right moment. I, I know that's not simple, but really, I think that's the only way uh, because we are all so different and you're, you know, whoever you're dating is also different too. I think one other thing that I wanted to mention about this, because I we do get a lot of questions about this and I, I know it's a very difficult conversation for right. somebody who's wanting it to bring it up. Uh, I think it's important to, if you feel compelled to bring it up, uh, you should express it. We're talking about self-expressive relationship and you know, this is a mm -hmm. relationship that you should be able to ask those um, and raise those issues. I think it's also important to not have certain expectation or outcome in mind. You know, you don't know how the other person's gonna respond. And if you're trying to force an outcome and if you're like wanting to hear, okay, I have the same relationship, well, that may not happen. And uh, I think you kind of have to be, we have to be open to the possibility that the conversation may take us to some unexpected places that you may, uh, may be better than what you expected. You may be worse than, you know, not what you mm -hmm. expected. And who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, important to have the conversation, but also not have like certain outcome in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. The second question is a lot of people say when you stop looking for someone to date, they'll show up. What is your stance on this? I don't believe this is true. It seems, uh, it seems psychological. Um, I, I don't know that there's any evidence on that either way, which means I'm, I'm reluctant to speculate. Um, if it were true, again, I'm speculating here, it, it's, it, you know, these things aren't magic, right? So, so if it were true, it would probably have something to do with when you're trying too hard, you sort of might come off as anxious or push things in ways that, that don't feel natural. And then when you step off the accelerator a bit, you're a little bit more yourself. Um, so I don't even know if the thing is true. If the thing is true, I could imagine that, that there could be, let's say it this way. Um, if you feel miserable because I keep doing this and it's a nightmare, it's probably a good time to take a breather, like a mental health break for you. And I recognize that that's a month or two months or three months that you've lost the potential dating time where you might've met the one, but the odds aren't great that it was like that narrow window. And if you can come back and just feel ready for the moment, um, it, it may well put you in the sort of headspace where you're more yourself and a little bit readier for what comes next. But here again, I'm speculating beyond the evidence. Yeah, and you're right. I don't think I've also come across any evidence of like that really happening. But you know, when you going back to the sense of play, when you're feeling like you're playing, of course, time goes up, goes right. quickly, right? And so I, I'm venturing to guess that that's kind of what people say when like when you're not so attached, okay, I have to do this, this is like a work that I have to do. Of course, it feels like a grind and it feels like it's taking forever. Mm -hmm. But when you're not really, you know, uh, putting pressure on yourself and you kind of are like, oh, I'm just playing, then it, it just goes by so quickly that it feels like it just kind of happened in no time is kind of what I'm guessing uh, is the phenomenon that's happening. But I'm also speculating here. Just a, a little corollary on what you're saying is uh, ideally the date that you do is fun independently. So even if you don't really spark with the person, but you went for a three mile hike somewhere pretty, you know, if, if you're able to do that, like we've really gotten boring with the sort of resume exchange over coffee or beer, I like or other drinks. So, you know, if you could do something that you would enjoy doing, even if there were no connection, that that's so, sort of a good headspace to go into the date with because it keeps expectations in check and you're doing right. something fun. Right, which is why the point that you raise about you know, taking that mental break is so important because you can't really yeah. do that when you're like, oh, like I have to do this again. Um, okay, one last question from Kenji uh, underscore Moto. What is your dating advice uh, for finding love during COVID? Oh, um, am I allowed to throw this one to you? I feel like you're more of an authority on this one than I am. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, yes, for sure. So my advice to you during uh, finding love during COVID is that even though it feels like it may, um, it may feel like you, may, you have to do something very, very different. Like, okay, so it's now COVID. Yes, it's a little bit harder to meet people. And now I feel like I radically have to you know, change the approach that I've been taking. Maybe I shouldn't actually meet anyone right now. Um, what we are finding is that a lot of people are continuing to have success meeting people and meeting somebody that they're interested in going on dates with, multiple dates with, maybe even get into relationship um, through things like, I, and of course I have to mention online dating um, because uh, you know I'm the founder of Coffee Meets Bagel, but truly 
because it do, it kind of takes out the necessity of physical meetup, which does um, which is a a risk now um, with with COVID. Online dating really is like the most convenient way for you to get, continue to get access to people. And with things like video dating, it doesn't have you don't have to radically change the way you've been doing things. Um, in fact, I think a lot more people are finding success. Uh, uh, finding somebody to connect more deeply because people are taking things slower um, and people are actually, uh, there's a lot of statistics uh, that, that says actually people are rethinking uh, what kind of relationship they want to create, what kind of person they want to meet, they want to stop kind of meeting people who are not really interested in them or not really serious in them. And so this actually is a, you know, I tell people this actually could be a really good time um, if you're, especially if you're looking for a long-term relationship to uh, continue dating through means like um, uh, online dating. May, may, I, may I pose a, a challenging question for you? So I agree with all of that. It's really the sex part that I think is challenging. So, so some part of what you said was, well, you can, you know, you can do the video you know, thing. So, so what are you including in the video thing? Um, like, because one of, I mean, um, some of the research from our field suggests that it's really one things get physical when you start kissing and hooking up that you start getting a sense of this person and I have some chemistry compatibility or not. Like it's often hard to tell until then. And so what is the sort of, what is the sort of pandemic approved version of that? To what degree are we involving technology in our sex lives? And how do people make decisions about when they're going to you know, stop with the social distancing because they can't keep their virtual hands off each other or they want their physical hands on each other. Um, have you given any thought to that? Because th that is what I think is some of the most interesting and complicated stuff happening now. Yeah, and you know, with this one, I think I kind of go back to uh, the answer that we uh, we've kind of uh, uh, gave to share with the listener in the very beginning with the when is the best time to talk about relationship goal everyone kind of has a different standards and a different risk tolerance when it comes to COVID and physical touch. Some people are actually completely fine going on social distance dating. Some people actually want to take longer. Uh, when we, we do regular survey with our daters and most people seem to be actually okay after a little bit of conversation, after having explicit discussion about, hey, how are you actually quarantining? Um, mm -hmm. And having developed a little bit of level of trust which is required for any kind of dating. And even if you're having, you know, deciding to have sex in a normal, you know, non-COVID situation, of course, right. you have to have a level of trust that you've developed in order for you to make that decision. Now that bar is a little bit higher because the risk is higher. And so mm -hmm. uh, people are having explicit conversation about that. And when you feel comfortable uh, and when your the risk tolerance is, um, you know, met, that's when people are kind of proceeding to whatever next step they feel comfortable with. And I think it's really good because I'm under the, you know, uh, my opinion is that we've kind of gotten into this like pattern of, uh, uh, again, I think there's a like expectation of certain physical things to be happening by a certain date. Okay, by first date, if I don't kiss, then there's something wrong here. If I don't have sex by like second, third date, there's something wrong there. Uh, and so I think some of us have been feeling pressured or kind of trapped in, okay, I have to follow this rule. With this COVID, everything's kind of thrown out the window and you can, you now almost have an excuse to follow your intuition about what feels right for you and only take action in the next step when you feel like uh, you've built that level of trust with this other person. So I think it's actually good. All that and sexy selfies. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Okay, Eli, my last two quick questions that I ask all the guests who come on the show, what is the best dating advice you've ever received? Boy. You know what? It was when I was very young. Um, by that, I mean 14 or something like that. And um, I was asked to a dance from somebody I wasn't that interested in. And I, I was, I happened to be at a, a few days later, I was at a wedding where like an older cousin was, was offering advice to me. And I was ambivalent. Like, do I say yes to go to the dance, even though I'm maybe not that interested. And his advice was, you know, basically go for it. It was a little bit like your, your signature line in your, your CV. It was like, you know, go do it. And it, it you know, it doesn't have to be the per doesn't have to be the perfect person. doesn't have to be forever, but like, going on a date is in general better than not going on any. Now I understand in the online dating world, it can be like a full-time job, but I thought that that was very useful advice for the 14 year old me. 
Mm-hmm. And once you once you've done it, once you do it, it's like, oh, that wasn't like crazy, right? Totally. Almost everybody's like a reasonable person. I mean, again, I'm aware that truly horrible thinking, truly horrible things happen. Thank God, it's rare that truly horrible things happen. So, in a worst case scenario, it's like not that good a date, and it's a funny story. <laughs> Great advice. Okay, the the last question is: What is the one piece of advice you think you could help CMB daters? Uh, what is the one piece of advice you think could help CNB daters looking to create a great long-term relationship in today's dating world? Um, I think that, so if we're, you're asking about people who are currently single, what can they do to do it? You know, one thing that I don't think is especially romantic builds on what I was saying before, which is it, I don't want to say dating is a numbers game because it sounds too cynical, but I think an orientation toward saying yes in cases where you're on the fence is probably a good idea in large part for the reasons I said earlier, which is we think we really know what will turn us on in a partner or actually make us feel attracted. And we're pretty much wrong, not wrong, but not any righter than what would turn on the next person. So I, I would say like, opt in the direction of saying yes rather than no in the borderline cases. And the other is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a cool time to be doing things other than vegging out in front of the TV. It is, you know, there are things that we can do to learn about ourselves, to make ourselves a more interesting partner, but not just to be interesting to other people, but to be a more three-dimensional human being. And in, in, it can involve reading novels, it could involve uh, artwork, something that's about the cultivation of ourselves. And I will say, if you end up in a relationship, and especially if you have kids in that relationship, the amount of freedom that you have will be radically restricted. And I'm not saying you'll necessarily look back fondly on those moments when you sort of wished you had a partner, but there will be things about them that you miss. So to the degree that you can take advantage of them now, you're doing the rest of us a favor. Thank you for enjoying these, you know, less, less, uh, um, what's the word, less, um, restricted uh, moments where you can sort of be responsible for yourself and, and enjoy and grow in those ways. I love that. And, you know, I think it's so easy to feel like the grass is greener on the other side. And sometimes we as daters forget that, wow, like all this, this is a privilege to have all this uh, time for ourselves in a way. There are upsides. Yeah. Right. Uh, that, you know, and then you can invest in things like you know, interesting things that you mentioned or, you know, art of cultivating love. Uh, cultivating art of loving. Um, so yeah, a lot of, lot of flexibility and freedom that's in your hand. Thank you so much, Eli, for joining me this morning. Thanks and for thank, having me. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I will see you guys back in two weeks. Bye-bye.